Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thanks, Dr. Shah and Dr. Pathiban for the invite. Um, it's almost three centuries down uh, from the first description of ankle fractures, and surely we know how to fix them. So there shouldn't be any controversy. Um, so the talk is finished, uh, and you can all move on to the next one. But the reality is uh, there is controversy. There, there are things that we don't understand very well, and there are things that we want to get right, but don't get them right. Okay? So let's try and see what the controversies are. So swelling and timing on surgery, some of this has been already touched upon. Um, when do you fix your ankle fractures? Do you crack on straight away or you wait uh, and, and, and come back at a later time to do the definitive fixation? What about the blisters? We know we get fracture blisters around this because the soft tissue envelope is very thin. Uh, wh what to do with them and if you have to treat your fracture in, uh, in the presence of blisters, what are you going to do with the blisters? And how to define the stable versus unstable. We all know about the classifications of Lark Hansen or AO, but is this a stable injury or unstable injury? It's a, if it's a stable injury, you can get them to mobilize very quickly. If it's an unstable injury, you've got to do something about it. So do we understand that very well? And what about the syndesmosis? Some has already touched upon that. Um, and how do you fix them? Which device? When do you remove? Um, posterior malleolar fractures are special ones, and certainly we don't know much about um, whether to fix them from the front, from the back, and I'll touch upon that. And a little bit about rehabilitation. Get them going quick or put them in a plaster and wait. Okay, so is this ankle too swollen for fixation? Well, we can't say that uh, on this picture, but we certainly have that dilemma where we go and see the patient and think, oh God, that's too swollen. Um, or some people have no ankle is too uh, swollen for fixation. Let's crack on and, and fix them now. So timing of surgery is important because we want to get the outcome right. We want to get soft tissues healing very quickly because the fracture is only going to heal if you get the soft tissues healing. Okay, and this is emerging evidence that in the last few years, people have looked at it, and if you deal with your fractures very quickly within the first 24 hours, you're dealing with the hematoma as opposed to the tissue swelling, and you can actually reduce your fracture, stabilize, and your soft tissues heal. Okay, so there's evidence in the literature now um, and this is the systematic review, which again looks at that, um, and it's four times higher complication rate with your, with your wound infection and uh, wound dehiscence uh, if you go in later. Okay, so there is an argument for getting in and, and fixing things quickly. Blisters. About 5% of your ankle fractures will have blisters. And what are you going to do? have the distinction between the hemorrhagic and non-hemorrhagic ones. Non-hemorrhagic ones are the innocuous ones. The hemorrhagic ones need but more consideration. There is no consensus uh, in the literature whether you de-roof them or you get just uh, treat them uh, expectantly and let them settle down, let the nature do its job. But if you are doing that, there's a lit uh, paper uh, which has looked at it. Uh, you are going to look at it and de-roof it and treat it very carefully, uh, as Balwinder had shown in some of his slides, uh, and fix the fracture away from the site of your blisters so that you can at least have st uh, fracture stability. Okay, we know on the left side, we know that's a stable fracture. Everybody agrees with that. We know that's an unstable fracture. What about this? Is this a stable fracture? How many people think it's a stable fracture? Stable or not? No? Is this stable? Is this unstable? Okay, and that's an important distinction to make. And what uh, something's uh, already told us, you know, why do we worry about it? One millimeter of a displacement is going to give you 42% less contact surface, and three millimeters, almost 60% less contact surface. So there is an, it, it is important to understand that it is, uh, you know, the distinction is important. So how do you decide? This is our traditional trauma room teaching. We tell our residents, you know, look at the medial side, medial swelling, medial tenderness, medial ecchymosis. Obviously, you've got the medial side injury. Does the literature suggest this is the right way to do it? The answer is no. You know, Nick Van Dyke's group look, looked at it, and there's controversy. If you look at the medial side, it doesn't correlate to your medial injury. So how do we decide? So scrap that, that, that. You look at the stress views. Okay, how are you going to do your stress views? You do your stress views by doing gravity stress test, which is shown in here. So essentially, your foot is hanging off the edge of the table, 
Okay, your X-ray is coming through here, and the film is there. So what you get out of this, um, I'll show you in a minute. So the, the other way to do the same thing is to externally rotate and lift the foot up into dorsiflexion. Okay? Which one is better? Both do the same job, but manual stress requires time and more radiation exposure, and it's a bit more comfortable, uh, uncomfortable for your patients. This is the X-ray you get, and you flip it, at 90 degrees, and if your medial gap is opening more than five millimeters, then that's an unstable injury. But what does that mean for our practical management? Do you fix it, or do you treat it non-operatively still? Okay, these guys looked at it. You can still treat them non-operatively as long as your deep deltoid is intact. If your superficial deltoid is gone, you can uh, treat them non-operatively and get the same outcome, but watch them like a hawk. Do your x-ray, uh, on the week one and week two, rather than just do one x-ray and see whether the uh, fracture is displacing or not. Syndesmotic injuries, okay, so we know about 13% of our ankle fractures have syndesmotic injuries. It is a diagnostic challenge um, if ankle mortis is congruent. So you, you look at the ankle mortis, it looks fine, but the gap in between your fibula and tibia doesn't look right. There's something wrong there. So it is important to look carefully in that area. We know it, it happens with Weber C fractures, but it happens with Weber B fractures as well. So there's increasing awareness about your distal fibular fractures that are so-called Weber B having syndesmotic injuries. Do you fix them or not fix them? This is an important concept. So if you've got your medial side and lateral side fully stabilized and you've got rigid fixation, do you really need to stabilize your syndesmosis? And people have gone and looked at it. The answer is not very clear, but we know that if you don't stabilize, you still can l land with your syndesmosis being unstable, although your fractures have healed on either side. Okay, and if you are putting a plate and your, f your fracture is about four, four to five centimeters proximal to the ankle uh, uh, joint, then, sorry, I'll, uh, yeah? I've, okay, so yeah, that's okay to continue. Yeah? Right, thank you. Um, so, so coming back to the point I was making, if you are going uh, with your plate about four to five centimeters above the ankle joint, then surely there's something gone wrong with the syndesmosis. We looked at the fracture assessment. An intraoperative fluoroscopy or uh, image intensifier is flawed. We know that we get about 30 degrees of external rotation without actually realizing that we are malreducing things and we are not getting it right inside the operation theater. And yes, the Germans are you know, high tech and ultra uh, sophisticated with their intraoperative CTs. We are not in the UK. So we have to rely on the intraoperative uh, fluoroscopy. So what do we do? What you do is you look at the tibiofibular overlap, you look at the clear space, you look at your medial clear space, and we looked at these values already, and you look at the angle uh, of, let me just try and get that, yeah. So Taylor crural angle. Now, if all of the, these parameters are fine, then you're gonna have to stress the syndesmosis, right? Here's a case example of somebody who uh, had an RTA, they had an ankle fracture, and for good measure, they had the Lis Frank fracture dislocation as well on the lip ipsilateral side. Taken to theater as they came in, the ankle joint is reduced, fixed, and the Lis Frank is stabilized with temporary K wires. Do you think ankle joint is adequately reduced and uh, good to go with that? It doesn't look bad, does it? It looks pretty good on the ankle, but if you look carefully, we've got a fragment in the syndesmosis, and if I look back now, more carefully, there seems to be a shadow there, and, and the space here isn't quite right, is it? So it's just sort of paying attention to l these little details, and as the list frank was fixed, I had to fish out that fragment at the same time. So which test do you do, and how do you st assess your stability? So these are dynamic stuff that we're gonna do uh, inside the operation theater. You do the usual fluoroscopy, which you look at the uh, distances here. Then you do your hook test or cotton test, which is your coronal plane. So we're talking about moving in that direction, right? And that's important to understand. You're gonna pu pull this 
in that direction, you put the hook in under your II and put it in that, this direction. This is your cotton test. But the important thing is to assess the sagittal plane movement, which is completely at right angles to, to the cotton test. And that's the belotment test that we do. So do both, and that will give you an idea whether, you're, whether your ankle uh, syndesmosis is adequately reduced. How much force? It should be with your physiological normal force that y yeah, it moves. You, know? you don't have to crank it uh, out completely. Um, yes, there is increasing role of arthroscopy in most intraarticular fractures, and ankle is no different. Do we use them routinely? The answer is no. We don't use them routinely. You know, some centers are more into it than the others. But majority of the centers do not use ankle arthroscopy as reduction tool for your ankle fractures. Right, controversy. You put 3.5 millimeter, 4.5 millimeter screws. One, two, do you do three or four cortices? Do you do through the syndesmosis or above the syndesmosis? Um, tightrope, which we will look at this afternoon, uh, and whether you remove or retain the implant. Okay, so let's look at retain or remove the implant. Again, this is a review of literature, and what they've suggested is if you reserve your removal for intact screws that are causing hardware irritation or reduced range of motion, at four to six months. When we say reduced range of motion, we're talking about dorsiflexion restriction. So if you don't go beyond neutral, that will be the time I'll be routinely removing the uh, uh, screws. So I will assess them at three months, and if you're not getting beyond neutral in your ankle, uh, you've got to be thinking about removing the syndesmosis screw. What happens if you don't remove it? This is a paper from Vinod Panchpavi. We'll be listening to him tomorrow. Essentially, they will break. We know majority of those will break. 3.5 break more often than the 4.5s. Um, do we know the difference between the two? Um, the answer is no. We need bigger numbers, and the literature uh, doesn't have any of the papers with those sort of numbers with syndesmotic injuries at the moment. Which device is better? Do you use your um, dynamic device, which is your tightrope, which we will see, or do you use your static device, which is the traditional way of doing uh, syndesmotic fixation with a screw? Uh, we, we do know that there is lower rate of implant removal with tightrope. Um, there's outcomes are similar, but might be quicker return to work with the tightrope. And we don't know the, the long-term effects of tightrope, and we don't know the cost effectiveness because it's a, a, an expensive implant. This is just hot off the press. This has just been published uh, last month by Canadians. And in, in a level one study, they've looked at it and suggested that syndesmotic um, fixation is better with tightrope. Again, the numbers are small here. Okay, so what we do know, however, is that if your syndesmosis in the ankle fracture is gone, that patient is not going to do well. So you need to tell them from day one that if your syndesmosis is broken, unfortunately, your outcome is not going to be the same as a, as a standard bimalleolar fracture. Okay, posterior malleolar fractures. And again, we, we've already touched upon this, whether we know enough about how to fix them, and we know enough about what investigation to do. So they come in all sizes and shapes, and who will do a CT for this before going in to fix? Anybody? Okay, one, two, three, more, four. Okay. The reason is that we know that the posterior malleolar fractures uh, come in different shapes and sizes, okay? And this is, a, this is work by a Japanese guy, uh, Haraguchi. And it is important because then it determines where you're going to fix them from, okay? Not every posterior malleolar fracture can be fixed from, from the front. The this is traditional teaching again, 25% or less, leave it alone. I think that's changing quite a lot um, because what it means is, is your ankle stable and your joint reasonably congruent and you've got the non-articular part of the posterior mal then you can get away with it. This is very simple. Um, if it is in the joint and your joint is subluxing and your posterior stability is not right, you can't come out of the operation theatre like that. Can we sp speed up the talk? Because yeah, that's already we've already last one. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So again, how to fix them? Do you do from front to back or back to front? Again, a lot of 
uh, emphasis on going from back to front because you don't want to bolt the whole body uh, onto the foot. You want to bolt the foot back on the body. Okay, outcome of posterior malleolar fractures is bad as well. So I'm going to touch on the rehab. Essentially, two ways. You've got either cast or you've got the um, functional rehab. Functional rehab, quicker rehab, but has more chances of wound problems, and that's been borne out in those, those two studies. So the take home is, it is a common injury. We know there are lots of controversies. It is important to understand the basic biomechanics and mechanism. Early surgical intervention is good if you can get in within 24 hours and the swelling permits to uh, have the definitive fixation. Infected fixation don't do very well, we know that. And best way to assess the syndesmosis isn't uh, out there, but you, you need to understand what you're looking for. And your posterior mal and syndesmosis injuries are going to give you a bad outcome, whatever you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dichendra.